and we are live hello and welcome to the ask a budget show i hope you're all doing very well thank you so much for being here with me online tonight today wherever you are today tonight doesn't matter so before we begin as always let's take a look at who all is there on the live chat i can see shekhar once again shekhar mrinalini akhilesh illuminati greek rahul anurag vishnu mohanan swami jain Sunil Sagal, YK, Jay Dikshit, Captain Cool, Ankit Chaudhary, Vinyas, Threat Ripper, Pradyut Dev, Chandana Mondal, Om Bekerikar, hello, Bunny Red, Gitu Parna, Showcased, Kejo Meg, Arpita, Tanmay, Dibabrata, Flick Edits, Supriya, Internet Alpha, Pratyush, Feminist Slayer, Jijin, Venkatesh Krishnan Asuri, Vladimir Zelensky, <laughs> Pranay Kumar, Geopolitical, Totan Chaudhary, Ravindra, Zubon, Izung, Shekhar, Manish, Ashish, Prashant, Mithun, Gaurav, Saugat, Divyanshu, Rai, Siva Kumar, Supriya, John Wick, Mr. Mauritius, Wasi Makram, Badri Vishal, Tanmay Pandey, Tejas, Hello, Tejomeg, Agam Bori, Lance Log, Eddie, Wandering Monk, Rohit Sharma, Arav, Dibab, Dibabrata, Siva, Ramakrishna, Jaisil, Jaisil, Hamti, Alpha, Anshul Sharma, Mukund, Annarv, Unknown Desh Premi, Harshit, Badoria, Hello, Komal, Universal Pro, Jitu Chetri, Jay, Bonjour, Saurabh, Namaste, Falcon, Ankit, Captain Cool, and everybody else. I can go on forever, but yeah, let me end here. I will not be able to greet you all individually, but thank you so much for being on this live stream. Before we begin, uh, let me once again, uh, for those who don't know, let me tell you that I have created a course on geopolitics. Many, many of you have been asking me the past two years to create a course on geopolitics. So I have created that. The link is in the description. The link is ac.university. Very simple, very straightforward. Check it out only for serious uh, people who are really interested in understanding geopolitics. Go for it if you are interested. All right. With that said, let us go for the questions. And I can see lots of questions coming in. All right, so let's take some um, questions. Let's take uh, the first one by Mohammed Yakub Khan. What's your view on racism against Indian laborers by local, local Taiwanese and their ministers? Look, we have to understand that India has historically the past, I don't know, what, 100 years been an extremely poor country. Okay extremely poor country, destroyed, devastated by the British in 1947 when they left. Finally, India's GDP was like abysmal, less than, I don't know, less than 1% of the world's GDP. And India's life expectancy was what, 30, 31, something like that. Horribly devastated country. Okay. And nobody respects those who are poor. No one likes them because, you know, you're afraid that they'll come and ask for something. Give me some money, give me something or other. So historically, the past hundred or so years, people have had this very negative opinion of Indians. Poor a nation that is mired in poverty, nation that is mired in decay and, and all that. And after 47, all the way to 2014, there was no progress. There was no progress. India remained mired in socialism and India remained mired in poverty. The great election slogan used to be Roti Kapra Makan. Roti Kapra Makan basics basics just to stay alive so that's why people have and and these lingering notions these lingering impressions will not it, it, will, it will take time for these notions and these impressions to go to, to change india in the past decade has changed tremendously i would say since 91 there has been progress but the past decade we have solidified it in into policies that take the country forward so Despite India now progressing, despite India now genuinely being recognized as, as a major world power and so on, it will take time for these attitudes, these notions, these impressions, these beliefs about India to change. It will take time. Uh, so, and the fact is that there is racism in every country. Okay, there is racism everywhere in every country. No country is exempt for, from it. There, there could be some in India as well. I'm not talking, let's not talk about that that is not part of the question but every country has racism every nation believes or the people of every nation believe that they are the best and everybody else is an outsider and you know not good enough and all that so and and the chinese over the past 150 or 200 years have developed a certain kind of 
perception of India, a nation that is essentially a vassal, a puppet of the Western powers. And that, that began due to the participation of certain Indians in the opium wars in the middle of the, in the, middle of the 19th century. In, and in the opium wars, the British were, you know, they were extracting concessions from China. They were, you know, they had occupied Beijing. They had done all kinds of uh, terrible atrocities. They had uh, introduced foreign religions into China forcibly. Uh, and they used Indian labor, Indian soldiers. Okay. It was probably Indian soldiers that took part in many of these activities that the British uh, did in China. So the impression of Indians kind of went down from that time on, onwards in China. The Taiwanese are Chinese. So it's it's all of that. So there's going to be racism. Indians these days the Indians face in, face increased racism, not just in Taiwan locally, one one place, but if you look at social media, which I do from time to time, you will see a tremendous outpouring of racism against Indians. They've coined certain terms for Indians and all that, and so so on. And they, especially in the West, they, they seek to downplay anything India does and in disparage India. And that's because India is finally rising and they don't like it. You know, what's the term? Stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. Don't get off the reservation. These are American terms. So, you know, they, they feel threatened and insecure because of India's new, you know, newfound strength and India's continuing rise. So it's natural for these reactions to, to occur. And it's actually good. It tells you India is doing something right or many things right. And people are feeling insecure and, uh, you know, they're feeling insecure about it. And they're feeling threatened by India's rise, that India will eventually, you know, take over some of the glory that we had and that sort of thing. So I think it's just a natural process. The world is like an ecosystem, like a forest. And uh, you have, you know, imagine an aquarium fish tank with lots of different kinds of fish in there and the fish will all be cooperating and competing against each other the big fish want to eat the small fish the small fish want to eat smaller fish certain kinds of fish will band together so that together they have some kind of strength against the bigger fish and all that so that's just how it is and when some a small fish starts getting big there's going to be pushback from the other fish so that's just how it is these racist attitudes they obviously they, you You'll see more of that in certain countries and less in some countries. But I think it's just something we have to take in our stride. Uh, let's not keep, our, you know, take our eyes off the ball. Keep playing the ball. Forget about the noise, the chatter, the, the sledging that comes around from the opposition players. Keep your eye on the ball and show them who's the best. All right. <laughs> so, yeah, good question. Good question to start off with. Okay, Swami Jain says, if Europeans are descendants of Yamnaya, then why do most Indians not have blue eyes unlike Europeans? Well, uh, see, first of all, we're not entirely sure what's the origin of the Yamnaya. Uh, if you look at genetic uh, genetics research that you see today, the Yamnaya were the, uh, like, the map. Map. We need the map. When you talk about stuff like this, we have to put the map on the screen. I think it's a male thing, I believe. You know, it's a male thing to be obsessed with maps. Well, whatever. So the Yamnaya, according to current prevalent genetics research, originated somewhere in Central Asia, the Stans region, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, all that region. Okay, and uh, and maybe the origin of the Indo-European uh, languages was somewhere in the what do they call it? The 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 Southern Crescent or something. Which so. Initially, the Aryans used to, used to they, it was believed that they originated in Eastern Europe. Now it is Iran and so on. So these, you know, these, uh, this research as, as more and more data emerges, as more and more uh, research is done, these things will keep changing. And eventually, someday, maybe we'll find out where, what the origins are. But yes, the origins of the European people, most of them, uh, the ones who have the R1B haplogroup, the R2 haplogroup, all that, the origins are very much Yamnaya origins. Now, this term Yamnaya, it comes from the Russian word Yamna, which means a pit, a pit, a hole in the ground. So those people who are called, who we call Yamnaya today, they did not call themselves Yamnaya. We don't know what they call themselves. We have no idea what, what 
designation they had for themselves. We in India call ourselves Bharatiya or Indian. In France, France they call themselves Les Français, the French, and so on. We don't know. The Russians call themselves the Rus, and so on. These people who we call Yamnaya, we don't know what they call themselves. We don't know what language they spoke. But it is believed that they would have spoken an Indo-European language. They were reasonably tall, strong people, uh, roughly 5'10", 5'11", height, strongly built, uh, strong bones, horse riders. They should drink milk and all. And they rampaged across Europe. They just, you know, wiped out the native European male populations, not the female population, male populations, because they were all males. So definitely it is very clear now that this happened around 4,500 years before today. A sudden, ridiculously rapid invasion by these people from the East. And these people, like I said, they were 5, 10, 5, 11 tall on average. They were the males. They had strong bones. They had this diet based on dairy. And they had brown eyes and light, light brown skin and dark hair. Okay, that's how they were. Now, we are not sure for now. We cannot con conclude or we cannot claim that they were of Indian origin. And there's also a Yamnaya component to some extent in India. And the Yamnaya, like I said, at that time, they had dark hair, light brown skin. They were not white people. They did not have white skin. Okay, and probably did not have blue eyes. Probably this blue, this genetic mutation for blonde hair and blue eyes, it, it occurred somewhere in, I think, Western India or the Middle East. And then it spread across in the West, in the West. Uh, so this research is in progress. Uh, the Europeans, not all Europeans are descendants of Yamnaya, by the way. The Celtic peoples probably were. So, yeah. All the Europeans aren't descendants of Yamnaya, but uh, it's in Northern and Western Europe that you will see this Yamnaya, very strong uh, presence of Yamnaya ancestry. Now, why do Indians not have blue eyes? Because we are, we haven't imported those genetics to a large extent, you know, significant amounts of those genetics. Uh, the, you will find people with blue eyes in India. You will find people with green eyes. You'll find people of with all eye colors, all hair colors in India. You'll find blonde people. Very rare in India, but you will find some blonde people. I have met a person with red hair who's Indian. Okay, red hair. So you'll find all those genetics, but that's kind of a recessive trait. So to conclude, this research is still in progress. It's gonna go on, there's gonna be confusion, there's gonna be there's gonna be, you know, claims and counterclaims. New research emerges, new data emerges, then you claim this, then something else happens, then you claim that. So right now, it's it's a work in progress, this research. So right now, I personally am, am kind of not keeping track of what's happening when it comes to this Aryan invasion research. The Aryan invasion is a myth, OK? Uh, so I am currently not really keeping track of it closely. Uh, but in a couple of years, I could revisit that. So yeah, that is the deal. Is India going towards dictatorship? <laughs> okay, let us define what dictatorship means. Dictatorship means rule by, well, nominally one person, but it means that this, see, a dictator, he, it's typically a he. You can have she also, but let's say it's a he, okay? A, a dictator can never rule alone. There's a whole administrative foundation that this person needs he needs an inner circle of officers or or you know minions minions and there's there needs to be a very large outer circle of administrators all of that is is a it's it's a system and this person is the head and that person has somehow maneuvered himself to that position that's typically what a dictatorship is and in a dictatorship you have just one person who is the ruler there are no elections if elections happen those are fake elections and there are many countries where fake elections happen by the way okay you you conduct i mean in north north, north korea is the stereotypical dictatorship there's just one family that has ruled the past uh, i don't know since the korean war ended yeah uh, 50s it was kim il sung then kim jong then kim jong il then kim jong un so, the, so this guy, Kim Jong-un, Shri Kim Jong-un ji, is the third uh, uh, member of the dynasty, the Kim dynasty. So this is the stereotypical dictatorship. They have elections. They have elections. And Mr. Kim typically wins 99.98% of the vote. 
and that's how it is and that those that 0.02 percent uh whoever is responsible for that not good for them so even in a dictatorship you can have elections but it is one party and one person at the top and that person has a personality cult everybody there are statues of that person everywhere everybody bows down when that person appears you have to show you know you have to show your intense happiness and cry tears of joy when when when, when a member of the dynasty dies you have to mourn and tear out your hair and seven days of mourning everybody wears black that's what a dictatorship is and it is an authoritarian state a dictatorship uh people don't have a voice a certain opinions are strongly not discouraged but completely not allowed and there is repression and there typically are concentration camps often and so on okay and no dissent is allowed nobody dare say a word against the ruler that's a dictatorship now take a look at india you see a barrage of abuse online on social media on youtube on twitter on facebook you see a barrage of abuse and criticism against prime minister modi every single day do you call that a dictatorship i mean if there was a real dictator in place in india a real dictator nobody would dare say a word okay so that's not a dictatorship and once again in india you have like 789 political parties that number could be less actually or more actually i could be my my that figure that i just gave out could be very low actually so there could be more there could be thousands of political parties in india every sing, single city has a political party of its own every state has like 17 18 different regional parties every single uh, religion has like 18 political parties for it special interest groups and all it's a chaotic democracy that's what we have in india there is no consolidation centralization of power so india is not going towards a dictatorship despite to what whoever may be saying i don't know who it is i don't keep track of what people say but yeah <laughs> that's the deal uh tanmay pandey says this government's policy against china is weak year by year trade deficit is incre increasing Look, you can't control the global economy. You need to import certain things and all. Uh, what India, see, there are certain things India needs to do vis-a-vis -vis China. Trade, of course, yeah. If there is a trade deficit, they benefit from it and they can use that against you, essentially. They can fund your enemies. They can use that to construct infrastructure uh, against you and so on and so forth. I'm sure there will be uh, steps that will be taken long term. See, these issues are long-standing issues you can't resolve them overnight of course this government has been in power for 10 years that is true uh, but certain certain problems i think they take longer to resolve what india really needs to do is to have an effective set of deterrents against the chinese the real problem is not the chinese economy india's economy is also rising it's rising now faster than china's china's economy china's economy has had a 20 year 25 year 30 year head start we started late so it's going to take time for us to grow larger as an economy it's it's a game of patience it's we we to we to be we are in this for the long term long haul uh, what what india really needs to do against china is to have a set of policies non negotiables that we need to implement one of the things is that we need to significantly bolster our military capabilities that only happens if your gdp rises because the more the, the larger your economy is the larger your gdp is the more you can spend on military uh, expenditure so the GDP needs to rise, the Indian economy needs to rise for 20 years minimum at a, at a reasonable rate, 7-8%, 6 7-8%. Uh, correspondingly, the, G, the military expenditure needs to rise. India must maintain a very effective nuclear deterrent vis-a-vis -vis China, and we are doing that. The Agni-5 MIRV missile test, in case you don't know what it is, check out my video on that, in which I've explained what that is. So that is a very potent deterrent against China. The, the Agni-5 can cover all of China and more. And it has MIRB capabilities, which means we can release multiple miss multiple warheads from one missile, and these can all be targeted independently of each other, and so on. So there's a set of things India must do, and those are the more critical things, because China is an existential threat. You know, you could say that. So that's what India needs to do. Apart from that, we can cooperate with China in certain things as far as it, it benefits us as well. So I would not say that if this government's policy against China is weak. There are lots of compulsions that we, the public, may not be aware of. Okay? We have access to some data and, and, and lots of opinions of some great uh, influencers. 
there, there are things the government knows and is aware of that we are not supposed to know. And based on all that, the government will take the best decisions for the country. That's what it go. That's I mean, this government at least does that. Past governments, one would not be very sure about. So I would disagree with you, Tanmay, that this government's policy against China is weak. Yes, we, we have a trade deficit. That is something that needs to be tackled. But the world is not only about trade. If you see my course on geopolitics, you will realize that the hard power economy, the, the GDP is just one component of hard power. We tend to look at global rankings, you know, power rankings. The, 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 we, we tend to look at the strength of nations purely based on GDP. Well, that is a very naive and oversimplistic approach. There is so much more that goes into a nation's hard power. So we need to have a more holistic look at what is it that goes into constructing the hard power score of a nation. So that's, uh, yeah, if you're interested, that's, that's covered in my course. All right, let's take some more questions. Rid says, are the Turkish people Turkified Greeks since they are genetically similar or closer to the Greeks, Southern Italians and Southern Europeans? Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's talk about Turkey. This nation, Turkey, they call it. Shall we use the map? Let us use the map. All right. I hope we all know where Turkey is. We know where India is. Go westwards. There is a temporary nation. There is Iran. There's Iraq, Syria, and then Turkey. Turkey. This nation here. So today, you go to this place, they speak Turkish, they practice a Turkish version of the religion of the Arabs, the, the Islamic religion. And uh, yeah, so it's a, and the culture is Turkic or Turkish culture. Now, how did the Turks end up in this region? Because historically, this was Anatolia, it was a Greek region. Greeks and Armenians and Georgians lived here. There were no Turks there. So what happened? So this all happened in the late 1200s. Was it no? Sorry, early 1200s, early 1200s, the first quarter of the 13th century. So at that time, our dear friends, the Turks, they used to live on the edges of the Gobi Desert, and they used to live in various parts of Central Asia. All right, the Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, all that that region, not Tajikistan, but other parts of Central Asia. Now, what happened is that a sudden force of nature erupted out of Mongolia. It was the great uh, you know, freedom fighter, Sri Chinggis Khan. And he decided to invade the empire of Khwarazm, which was based out of Iran and Turkmenistan at the time. This was a Turkic empire. It was the Turks who were ruling Iran at the time. Now, Chinggis Khan did this in retaliation for atrocities committed by the Khwarazmians against Mongols. So Chinggis Khan comes out of Mongolia. He goes westwards. And these Turks who are living in Central Asia, they run for their lives. They run for their lives because they know that this is, this is a force of nature, nature that they cannot handle, the Mongols. So what they do is they run westwards. They run, they escape westwards. And eventually, from the uh, Caucasus region, they make their way into Anatolia. And in Anatolia, you had very, you know, harmless people more or less i mean they must have fought to some extent but they were very easily conquered uh, and at that time what we call anatolia was you had the byzantine empire in parts of anatolia so there was a long period of the turks fighting the byzantines the byzantine empire was the eastern roman empire and eventually the turks were able to conquer and destroy the byzantine empire and then they took over they essentially took over what was left of the Byzantine Empire, and their capital was Constantinople, now called Istanbul. Now, the Turks were small in number. The population of Anatolia and Thrace, which is like Western, the European part of Turkey, all of that, there was much larger. So what the Turks would do, they had this custom called bride kidnapping, in which you just go and capture whatever girl, woman you want, and you force that girl to marry you. And they did this for generations. They're still doing that in Cyprus. So northern Cyprus is under Turkish occupation okay, since the 1970s. And they are doing that to Greek women even now in Cyprus. So that's the deal. So over time, over several generations, the Turks, there was hardly any Turkic component left in the Turks. And if you look at the genetics of the Turks today, 
you will find there there's almost nothing from central asia in there it's all uh, anatolia greek the anatolians were mainly greeks and armenians and georgians to some extent uh, yeah so th their genetics are much closer like you say to the greeks the southern italians and the southern europeans so they are very much turkified greeks but most of them would be very offended if you said that, despite the genetic evidence that's all around the place now. But that, that's just what it is. There will be some trace Central Asian Turkic component left in most people. Some people may have a little more, but most of them have very little of it, or if none, maybe some of them have none of it. Uh, so yeah, that is that is indeed true. The Turks are Turkified. The Turkish people are Turkified Greeks. <clears throat> All right, what else do we have? Sound guy Abhishek Varu says, does the brain store audible data when we sleep? I fell asleep listening to a podcast with headphones on. Next day I sensed deja vu every moment, every minute I replayed it. So we don't know. Uh, neuroscience, neurology, all of that is a big mystery. We know what the brain looks like. Uh, when you go to medical school, you get to dissect brains and all that, take slices and sections, and we know everything which is inside the brain, the various components, the pons, the medulla oblongata, the various uh, whatever components we have of the brain, but we don't know how they function. We know at a microscopic level how neurons connect with each other, and that's how they form memories. We know how they communicate through e with e electrical impulses and signals through ions, calcium, sodium, whatever it is, I don't remember now, it's been too long, and so on. So we know how neurons communicate with each other, how memories seem to be formed. We know what the different components of the brain are, the frontal cord, frontal lobe, and whatever else. We know how the, the, the eyes are actually an extension of the brain, okay? They are the light gathering device and they are directly connected to the brain so if you squeeze your eyes like that it's gonna kind of end up squeezing your brain but nature has we have adapted and evolved to that in such a way that it doesn't really hurt the brain harm the brain the, the point is we don't know how various kinds of data are stored in the brain we know where sound auditory data is stored in what part of the brain we know where optical data is stored in what part of part of the brain we know that you can even disconnect two parts of the brain for whatever reason and then you will have two split personalities of, of, of sorts uh, and so on the point is we don't know how this works and what happens so when we are asleep what happens i think we we uh, are not quite connected to the end to the world unless there's a big noise or some big flash or something then it may wake us up but otherwise we are kind of oblivious to what's happening outside but and yet and yet it is possible that these uh, sounds that are being uh, piped into the ears through your headphones, they may have some effect and some memories may, may be formed. We don't know, but it is possible. It is not out of the question. So we don't have definitive answers, but the possibility does indeed exist. Okay. Um, Abhiraj Kankate says, Kankate says, what do you say about Isis K comment for Bharat? So I've heard they made some comment. I have not seen the comment. Uh, once again, let's go to the map because you, if you want to understand what the deal is. So these fellows, they are called Isis Khwarazm province. Khorasan, Khorasan province. So Khorasan comes from the term Khwarazm, the old term Khwarazm, which was the Turkic uh, kingdom that Chinggis Khan invaded and obliterated. So Khorasan is this region, essentially Iran, Afghanistan, Central Asia, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, that sort of thing. And uh, this ISIS case is kind of based out of this area. So northwest of India, Afghanistan and Tajikistan, maybe Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, that sort of thing, definitely not Iran. And one of their stated targets, officially stated targets is India. Okay, And they see India as obviously a unfriendly nation. And they have also apparently taken credit, credit for the recent terrorist attack in Moscow. But I don't think that is, indeed, that is the case because it looks like a fake claim. So I don't know what comment they have made. But the point is that India needs to be very much aware of this threat. Any 
terrorist organization that has uh, that exists in the vicinity in the larger uh, surrounding area of india whether it has stated it's uh, made any threat or not india needs to be careful uh, about that and india needs to track those activities very carefully and i'm sure that india is doing that so that is what i can say about this matter kiruma suichi Hugh Masuichi says, ancient connection and brotherhood between India and Iran could have been one of the reasons India didn't expand and conquer repeatedly in Central Asia, even though we could have. Indians did conquer Central Asia, parts of Central Asia. One example is Kanishka. Now, some people will say Kanishka was a Kushan. He came from somewhere else. Do you know how much he did for Indian culture and how much he did to safeguard India's national interests? Kanishka was very much Indian. 100%, 200% like this. 10,000% Indian. More Indian than certain other emperors that people like to deify and worship. Jalaluddin Akbar, Zahiruddin, Babar, you call those guys Indians? Yeah, Kanishka was Indian. Now, Kanishka, once again, let's go to the map. I don't know why, I love the map. So Kanishka conquered much, so his, his kingdom, it touched the shores of the Caspian Sea and the Aral Sea. The Aral Sea has now more or less disappeared, but you can see the Caspian Sea is. It's north of Tehran. This is the Caspian Sea. So Kanishka's empire touched the shores of the Caspian Sea and the Aral Sea. And he also conquered what is today Tibet and Xinjiang, all the way to the Tarim River Basin. Okay, Today's, uh, what's it called? Taklamakan Desert. All of that was conquered by Sri Kanishka. So that's one example. Then you had, I think, Kumara Gupta from the Gupta Empire, who conquered uh, Bahalik who defeated Bahalik and uh, turned them into a vassal state. Bahalik is uh, Balkh, which is uh, present-day Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, that region. So Afghanistan, of course, it's it's uh, part of the subcontinent. But yeah, today some people consider Afghanistan to be part of Central Asia, which I would not agree with. Uh, but yes, so Kumara Gupta did venture into Central Asia, not far beyond Gandhara, but to some extent he did. Then you had Lalita Ditya Muktapida, who conquered large parts of Central Asia, right? So. Central Asia wasn't Iranian. Central Asia was Indo-Iranian. You had the Shaka people living there, the Scythians. The Scythians were Indo-Iranian. When they came and conquered India around uh, 2,100 years ago, they had the same culture as the Indians. There was no clash between the Indians and the Scythians. They harmoniously integrated into Indian society. It is only after the Turks rampaged across Central Asia that the genetics and the culture changed in Central Asia. Today, if you look at Central Asia, it's all Turkic. All these Tans, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, these are Turkic nations. The people in these nations will be like a mixture of ethnicities, half Turkic, half old Scythian. So, and maybe more Scythian, maybe more Turkic. Or maybe the male genetic lineage will be Turkic and the female genetic lineage could be uh, Scythian, that sort of thing. The Uyghurs are a classic example. Some of them look very Indian. And some of them look very Turkic and so on. So, so India did conquer Central Asia at various points in time. It has nothing to do with Iran. India and Iran have never fought a war until that uh, barbarian Nadir Shah invaded India uh, about 300 years ago. Roughly, I don't remember the date. You can look it up. Nadir Shah was not Iranian, by the way. He was not Persian. He was a Turk. Once again, he was a Turk who was ruling Iran. The Iranians, the Persians have never ever fought with India and India has never ever fought with Persia. Never ever happened. Remember the days, I mean, in case you know, of the Achaemenid dynasty, the Achaemenid, the Hakshamanish dynasty, which ruled about two and a half thousand years ago. Some of their great kings were Darius, uh, Kurush, that they call Cyrus. Uh, who else did we have? Uh, Artakshatra. Artaxerxes and so on. Great kings they had. They all fought the Greeks and the Romans. They never fought India. They were expansionist, militaristic emperors, kings. They never ever thought to fight India. They always went westwards. Why? That is the old uh, relationship between India and Iran. Okay. That is the ancient connection. That is the brotherhood. And when the Iranians finally, the Persians finally fell to the Arabic invasions, they wished that India would come to the to the rescue. But uh, at that time, India also was not in a great shape. India was not unified politically after the fall of the Gupta Empire. And so it did not work out. So to recap, this doesn't uh, 
the fact that India, first of all, India did repeatedly, multiple times conquer parts of Central Asia, sometimes more, sometimes less, and uh, it had nothing to do with Iran. But yes, it's a good way of thinking to try and understand cause and effect. So overall, it's a great question. Okay. Um, Shoaib says, when will the Indian Air Force get its fifth generation fighter aircraft? Don't you think it's quite late? Um, the first fifth generation fighter aircraft that I can think of was the F-22 Raptor, the American plane. It's a great plane. I think it's better than the F-35. So there's the F-22 Raptor, which kind of is a, it, on par with 4.5 generation aircraft today, but it's considered to be a fifth generation aircraft. Then you have the F-35, then you have what else? The Chinese have a knockoff of the F-22, which they call the J-something. It's a complete copy of the, uh, of the F-22, which they acquired. They acquired the blueprints through hacking. Through this operation in the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, the operation, the Americans called it Operation Titan Rain, which was a massive Chinese hacking effort. So the Chinese acquired blueprints, detailed blueprints of the F-22 Raptor, and then they constructed the J-whatever, J-something, J, I don't remember what, what number it is, J-something, which is a complete knockoff, uh, an inferior knockoff of the F-22 Raptor. So there are certain uh, several nations that uh, have what's called fifth generation fighter aircraft. Typically, these aircraft have, have stealth capabilities and so on. So the question is, when will in, the Indian Air Force get a fifth generation fighter aircraft? So we are developing the, the AMCA. I believe that's the one that will be the fifth generation fighter aircraft. Sometime in the 2030s, it could be operational. I think the first flight could be around 2029, 20, 2030 or some, uh, something like that. I could be mistaken. I'm not keeping track of this. Okay. But uh, if it is indeed inducted, it will be inducted. Not if, but when it is inducted, it will be in the early, the first half of the 2030s. So, you know, the thing is this. Fighter plane development is a long drawn out process. Look at the, the development life cycle of the F-35. It's taken so many decades. Every fighter plane has a whole life cycle, and then the first prototype rolls out, and then it may work or not work, then you make a second prototype, third prototype, then you eventually induct the fighter, which is just the fighter plane into the armed forces in small numbers, but that is just the first version. Then you have to create a version 2, version 3. So it takes time, and then lots of versions happen, and eventually you can kind of perfect it. It's a long process. So it, it'll be great if India can have this fighter plane this AMCA by the 2030s, early 2030s. Uh, yeah, so it takes time. By that time, we should obviously work on the Tejas. We have Mark 1A, which is just rolled out now. You'll have the Tejas 2 as well. Oh, I'm not sure what, if it's called the Tejas 2 or whatever it's called, but it's going to be a, a superior version of the, of the Tejas compared to what we have today. So it's it's a process. We had a great fighter plane in the 1960s. It was called the Marut. If we had not discontinued that, then we would have had several families of fighter planes based on that. But we didn't discontinue, discontinue that. The wonderful, whoever it was, the Prime Minister and Government of India at the time, they decided to discontinue that fighter plane. So now we are in this situation. It takes time. The point is this, actually. We are now, by the way, in the 21st century. We have AI. We have drones, we have un unmanned aircraft. And you know, these autonomous AI equipped unmanned aircraft can do way more damage than a fifth generation fighter plane. So I think by the 2030s, India could also, they will certainly develop the fifth generation fighter plane, but we will also most likely pivot in the direction of autonomous unmanned flying aircraft or flying fighters. You know, uh, if you were to compare, okay, how much damage a single fifth generation fighter plane can do compared to a swarm of drones, autonomous drones, I promise you those autonomous drones can inflict way more damage. First of all, they are small. They are very hard to take down. And let's say you have a swarm of 200 drones. Let's say the enemy takes out 150 of them, okay, somehow. But those 50 that are left will still do enormous damage, more than one fifth generation fighter aircraft and these drones are inexpensive comparatively relatively speaking so 200 drones will cost way less than one fifth generation fighter aircraft that's what these 
wars that we are witnessing are telling us. The uh, Arthasakh war that happened a couple of years ago, that was when you first saw the deadly use of loitering munitions, suicide drones. And then the, the situation in Ukraine, that, that's showing us how wars will be fought in the 21st century. And how many fighter planes have you seen in action during the Ukraine war? The Ukrainians claim they have shot down 78 fighter planes, Sukhois and whatnot. Okay, okay, that's fine. But in in the real world, none of that has happened. So the, the 21st century wars will actually be fought with drones, loitering munitions, drone swarms. And these uh, new tactics will be more will be much deadlier than fifth generation fighter planes. So India will definitely already be pivoting in the direction whether we know it or not. So we need not worry if our fifth generation fighter aircraft will be rolled out in the 2030s. We are doing good work in drones and other stuff and certain things we don't even talk about. So, so yeah, I think we are in good shape. We need to be optimistic. Obviously, we need to do more. We always must do more. But this is the situation, actually. <clears throat> OK. They just says, why does why do the Chinese, why do the Chinese deny King Lalita Ditya's conquest over China and Asia? I'm not sure if he conquered China, but let's take a look at the map. All right? Let's take a look at the map. So Lalita Ditya Muktapida was this king who was based out of uh, northern India. Srinagar was his capital. And he was a great conqueror. In a in a short career, he conquered large parts of Central Asia. He is also said to have conquered some parts of Tibet. But historically, historically, what we see as China today was not China. Let me search for the Great Wall of China. Where is the Great Wall of China? Okay, it's somewhere here. Okay, we've got a pin. We got a pin. So witness where the Great Wall of China is. You see, it was somewhere here. Let me try and find a different map. Let's go to Google. Let's go to Google. Let's do a Google search for a the Great Wall of China. Here's Google, our friend on the screen, Great Wall of China. And we'll go to images. And we'll try and find a map. Now, these maps that we will find online will not depict India's borders correctly. So please bear with me. It is not my doing. But let me just show this for illustration. Do you see where the Great Wall of China is? I think it's visible now. So these were this was the border of China, up here north, and east of the uh, and, and west of the westernmost extent of the wall was again the border of China. So Tibet was never part of China. Xinjiang was never part of China. Uh, Southern Mongolia was never part of China, and that is what we need to understand. If Lalita Ditya conquered Tibet, if he conquered Xinjiang. It was not China at the time. All that became part of China in the 20th century. All right? So the Chinese, and obviously now it is part of China. So you, you can claim. So today we can claim that Lita Ditya conquered what was what is now part of China. The point is, the Chinese have suffered lots of invasions. You know what they say. You know what the fact is? The Chinese have never succeeded, have never won a war that was fought on their territory by invaders. That's why they always seek to pressurize other, other countries and try to take the territory. But the moment there's a massive major invasion of China by an external force, they always lose. Uh, I had a podcast with Dr. Edward Lutwa uh, a couple of years ago. And he's a great geostrategist. He has, fought, he has served in, he has fought wars, okay, actually. And he has written books about the grand strategy of the Byzantine Empire, the grand strategy of the Soviet Union, and so on and so forth. Great guy. He knows a tremendous amount of stuff. And what Dr. Edward Lutwak said was that <laughs> to conquer China, all you need is three guys on horseback. That's what he said. And that's what's happened repeatedly. The Mongols, a bunch of ragtag tribals came and wiped out China. They flattened Beijing under the great conqueror Sri Chinggis Khan, uh, the warrior for peace, and so on. The Japanese did that. So many others did that. The Xiongnu did that. The Huns did that. The British did that, the Americans did that, and so on. 
So the Chinese are very sensitive about this matter. It hurts. It hurts. Okay. So that's why they would seek to deny. And they will claim that no, Ladita Ditya actually paid tribute to some Chinese king or some 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 nonsense like that. So you have to understand there are multiple reasons why they, they make this claim. First of all, the regions that he conquered were not part of China at the time. China was much smaller at the time. Uh, and, and secondly, it hurts. When you if you're Chinese, it hurts to acknowledge the fact that somebody conquered you. So yeah, that's these are the reasons why. GoCrow says, why India doesn't raise voice against the stolen land by the US Navy that you spoke about? Okay. <laughs> so let us once again go to open up the map. What is this place that I spoke about? So I spoke about the Chago, the, Chago, the Chagos Archipelago. The Chagos Archipelago is a cluster of islands in the Indian Ocean. It's part of the Lakshadweep Chagos Ridge, which is an underwater mountain range. And the mountain tops they poke out of the sea as islands. So we know where the Lakshadweep Islands are. Here we have the Lakshadweep. Then you have the Maldives, and then you have the so-called British Indian Ocean territory. And this used to be administered from Mauritius. And in 1965, the British separated it from Mauritius because they wanted to give Mauritius independence, but they wanted to keep Chagos. And they did this in contravention of a UN resolution number, whatever it is. You can look it up in my video. I don't remember the resolution number right now. And they kept this territory. And then they gave the island of Diego Garcia to the Americans. And before doing that, they evicted, they deported all the natives from this place. And they were shipped off to the Seychelles, some of them, and some of them to Mauritius. That's what happened. That's the long and short of it. If you want a detailed analysis, check, a, take a look at my video that, I, that came out like two, three days ago. So that is the thing. Now, uh, the, the people of Chagos, the people of Mauritius have gone to the United Nations. And the, United, the UN is very crystal clear about this, that the UK has no sovereignty over, chaos, over, over Chagos. And they need to give it back to Mauritius ASAP, and they need to allow the natives to return. But the British say that this what happened. They don't care about the UN. They don't care about human rights and freedom and democracy. It doesn't matter when the affected people are not white-skinned and so on. Okay, And that island, Diego Garcia, is entirely occupied and, and operated by the US. They have a very large, you want to see? Why not? They have a very large major military base here, naval base. They have a large, large airport here and massive, uh, a massive port as well. The port can handle aircraft carriers, submarines, destroyers, all kinds of warships. And this uh, runway is, is, as you can see, it's pretty massive. If you would like to measure the dimensions, it is 3.6 kilometers, right? And uh, yeah, they have a pretty extensive setup over here. This is the port. You can see, you can see uh, all the various facilities they have there, and so on. And there is more ground-based electro-optical deep space surveillance. It's a spy station, okay, and so on. So this is uh, what the Americans operate. Now, the question is that is being raised by GoCro is why hasn't India raised its voice against stolen land by the US Navy and the UK? Look, it is not India's job to go and fight every just war and to go and poke its nose into every issue. We have to understand one thing. The fact that the Americans have a major military base here, it's, it's terrible for the local people. But from a selfish Indian national interest perspective, it is good for us because it, it, it keeps the Chinese kind of at bay. Right? The Americans, they, they acquired this, this, <laughs> this island. The Americans acquired this island in 1973. Do you know why it became urgent for them to acquire it in 1973? Because of the debacle in 1971. They, American, the Americans were on the side of the Pakistanis. The Pakistanis were conducting genocide in uh, East Pakistan, present-day Bangladesh. They were killing massive numbers of uh, 
Bangladeshi Hindus mainly. And the Americans were on the side of the Pakistanis. And once the hostilities started, India it, was, it became clear that India could win this war. They sent the Americans sent the US uh, USS Enterprise, the aircraft carrier, with a whole uh, task force around it, other warships as well. And the British also sent an aircraft carrier ta task force. So there were two aircraft carrier task forces in the Bay of Bengal. And the Americans would have succeeded in arm twisting India into withdrawing from East Pakistan. Was it not for the USSR? The USSR sent a fleet of nuclear submarines to face off against the Americans and the British. And that's why the Americans had to back off. And that's why India was able to liberate Bangladesh and break Pakistan into two. So that's why it became urgent for the Americans to have a base from which they could project massive military power in the region. Now, today, India and America are not at loggerheads. And the American presence in this region is actually good for India, you know, from a selfish perspective, because it kind of counterbalances any possible Chinese actions in the Indian Ocean region. The Chinese can't be too active in the Indian, Indian Ocean region because of this massive US presence over here. They have the runway can take the heaviest of, of aircraft, heavy, heaviest of strategic bombers, and the port at Diego Garcia can accommodate aircraft carriers. So, from a selfish perspective for India, it's a good thing. Of course, that can be used to project power against India as well in the future, if, if need be. So it's kind of a, that kind of situation. So India doesn't have to raise its voice in every single matter. Okay. And India has officially stated that it supports the, the government of Mauritius. It supports Mauritius's claim on the Chagos Island. So India has put that on the record, but India doesn't go and fight a war, you know, and raise the issue. We have said it officially that we support Mauritius in this matter, that, that Mauritius must gain sovereignty, regain sovereignty over the Chagos Islands, which means the UK and the US must withdraw. We have said that officially, and that suffices. Right. Red says, how, um, how many languages do you speak? Is it possible to learn 10 or 20 languages? I know one person who speaks 13 languages. That guy's the CEO of a of a well multi-million dollar company. So that that gentleman speaks 13, 11 or 13 languages. I knew a professor, a lady, who spoke about 13 or 14 languages. I'm not sure how fluent she was in all of those languages, but she was a professor of linguistics. So it's it's possible for for some people, depending on their I don't know, level of intelligence or whatever, to learn multiple languages. How many do I speak? I speak four languages and I can understand three, four other languages to a certain extent. No, I would say much more than three, four. The, the thing is this, if you speak certain languages, you can understand a multitude of other languages without being able to converse in those languages. For example, if you speak French, you can understand Spanish, you can understand Italian, you can understand Portuguese, and so on. If you understand English, then you can see the similarities with German, and so on. Uh, if you understand any, let's say, any Sanskrit derived language, you can understand all the other Sanskrit derived languages to a certain extent. If you speak Hindi, you can understand some of Bengali, you can understand some Assamese, you can understand some Marathi, you can understand some whatever else. Uh, and if you, if you understand Tamil, you can definitely understand parts of Telugu, some of Kannada, uh, some Malayalam, I think a lot of Malayalam and so on. So the thing is that you, if you understand one language, you can understand multiple other languages that are related to it. If you understand Hindi, and if you pay attention, you may understand some parts of Persian as well, because Hindi and Persian are very closely related, related actually, even Pashto, even Pashto. So if you, if you approach learning languages in that manner that I already have some vocabulary of these languages, then it becomes much easier to learn those languages if you can make those connections. So I think I speak four languages. Uh, but it's definitely possible to learn many more. I did not bother to learn too many of them. Okay. Geopolitical Dubey says, finally, the government of India is restoring the great Martha and the Mandir and installing a statue of Samrat Lalit Aditya. Yes, I saw this news today, somewhere on social media, somewhere, I think on Twitter, X, that uh, there's going to be a meeting about uh, restoring 
various temples in Kashmir, and certainly the great uh, Surya Mandir, the Martanda Mandir, and the government will install a statue of the great emperor, the great conqueror, Sri Lalit Aditya Muktapida. So I think it's fantastic. We are beginning the process of decolonization. There were two kinds of colonizations in India. We think of colonization, colonialism as British colonialism, right? But there was a Turkic colonization also of India. And that also needs those, those scars, the damage it did, need to be undone slowly in a, in a proper manner, proper legal manner. And that, that, I think the process is beginning. So I think it is good. Uh, so yes, that, that great temple lies in ruins. It will be restored. I think, I, I hope the restoration is done well. Uh, I'm sure it will be done well. And a statue of the the, the builder of the temple, Lalit Aditya Muktapida, will be installed over there. So that is great. A very welcome move. And I am really glad that's happening. Gaurav Sharma says, this year NASA will send a crewed mission, Artemis 2, to the moon. But the crew will venture around the moon and return. Why not land on the moon? Uh, when you look back to the 1960s, the Apollo missions, uh, the first Apollo mission was a round trip around the moon. So you have to do things in stages. Uh, initially, you just test out the rocket; it works fine or not. The you know the vehicle, the launch vehicle. Then you send the launch vehicle on an uncrewed trip around the moon to see that it performs properly or not. You go and send it to, into moon's orbit, slingshot it, and uh, return back to Earth. You don't put any crew in that so that you see. But you create, but you create an environment that would sustain a crew with oxygen, pressure, and all that. And then you have instruments that will measure all the all the all the parameters so that you know that it, it's performed well. So you first send an uncrewed rocket, then you send a crewed rocket with crew with human crew, but you send them on a round trip around the moon. It, it, it does a slingshot uh, maneuver around the moon and, and returns to Earth. Not slingshot, but you know that maneuver, that figure eight maneuver. One part of the eight is small, one is big, and it returns to Earth. And then finally, when you are completely confident that everything performs fine, all the all the various systems, subsystems, components, subcomponents, all the everything performs nominally as expected, then you would send a crew to actually touch down on the moon. So it has to be done phase by phase. You cannot rush these things, otherwise it, it could end up in a disaster. When it comes to the Apollo program, once again, there was a disaster. There was a fire in one of the launches and it it killed three American astronauts on the launch pad. So they, they learned from that. They, they learned many lessons from that. First of all, the environment inside the capsule that contains the human crew should not be pure oxygen. And secondly, when there is, a, and, and secondly, the doors of the capsule should not open in, inwards. Because if there is high pressure inside, then you can't pull the door inwards and so on. So if you study the history of space flight, you will, you know, no, notice all these different incidents and the, the way uh, sometimes very hard and painful lessons had to be learned. So that's why this is any space agency would be extremely cautious, extremely prudent, extremely conservative, extremely careful while conducting human space flight missions, especially when they haven't done this in decades. The last year, American astronauts on the moon. Uh, I think they landed there in the 1970s. 70s, late 70s, I think, early 80s. I don't remember exactly, but I think late 70s. So it's been what, how many years? 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, 40, 45 years, almost 50 years since they've done this. So they're essentially learning this again from scratch. So they're going to be very careful, very conservative. First send an unmanned spacecraft, then send a crew around the moon, not touch down, then eventually touch down on the moon. That's how it's going to be. You have to be very careful. Because human life, if, if there is a, an incident and human lives are lost, then there's going to be big public outcry against this, and that could damage the pros prospects of the space program. Uh, that's why. <clears throat> um, let us see. <laughs> YK says Boeing airplanes. How did the quality drop over the years? Yeah, the quality of the US has dropped over the years. The standards that they hold themselves to as a nation, the United States, 
those standards have dropped drastically in the past couple of decades, especially in the past decade, the past 10 years, right? So if you go back to the 1950s, 1960s, the Americans had the highest standards in the world. They believed in American exceptionalism. They believed that they were truly the greatest country in the world. And they held themselves to those high standards, right? And that's why they were able to succeed the way they did. That's why they were able to do that. Now, in recent times, not recent times, it all began in the 1950s and 60s, this uh, infiltration of the academic system by leftists. And they brought in new ideas. They slowly started pushing socialist ideas. And eventually, the entire academic system of the US was captured by the socialists, the leftists, the Marxists, whatever you want to call them. And today, and they have successfully indoctrinated all the students, generations of students, into believing that capitalism is bad. I'm not saying it's good. I am personally not saying capitalism is good, but I also don't believe that socialism is good. Okay. But today, the, there is this indoctrination in the US. They believe in socialism. They, and the socialism automatically brings low standards. It causes a lowering of standards. You know the famous experiment, the professor uh, in his class, he says that uh, I'm going to have an exam tomorrow, test, test tomorrow, and I'm going to give everybody an average score. So whether you study or not, whatever scores, you get every let's say there are 100 students in the class and everybody gets a score from from 0 to 100 i'm going to take the average of all the scores and i'm going to give everybody the same score so for the first time this happens some people study really hard and they get almost 100 but some people do not study they get 40 50 and everybody got the same score so then over time the students who used to study really hard they said what's the point i'm not getting what i have earned what i've worked for so they stop studying so the average score of the class dropped over each successive test. And eventually it was near zero. So that is what socialism does. If you don't get the fruits of your labor, then you stop working hard. You stop caring. That's what socialism does. And that's what's happened to the US. So overall, the standards of that society, of the nation have dropped drastically. Uh, even cultural standards, all of that has, has gone, has, has dropped very much. And the same thing you will see in, in manufacturing. I mean, they gave up on manufacturing cars a long time ago. Elon Musk is the only guy that's, that's uh, still holding the flag. All the Detroit automobile manufacturers, they gave up to the Japanese. The Japanese had the highest standards, and these guys could not do that. Even, the, even in the 80s, they, they kind of gave up. So Detroit today is, is wasteland, and so on. When it comes to aircraft, uh, Boeing had, had high standards. Then they merged with McDonnell Douglas. Uh, I don't remember which year it happened. And then they shifted, their, they, they moved their headquarters from the original Boeing head, headquarters to the McDonnell Douglas headquarter, headquarters. And then this entire corporate culture came into place where it was all about managing and all that and not actually improving. And then you had all that... Uh, uh, affirmative action kind of stuff that came in so it's not one factor it's a it's it's multiple factors that led to the drop in quality of boeing aircraft and i think um, one would i would rather prefer to fly airbus these days so these days whenever i book a flight i check take a look at what is the make of the aircraft if it's an airbus <laughs> i'll travel otherwise not so much you know because yeah I mean, doors fly out, windows fly out, uh, engines fall off, wheels don't function. God knows. Uh, so yeah, Boeing, Boeing seems to be on on a very bad path right now. And McDonnell Douglas used to be a really great company. I have flown McDonnell Douglas planes as a kid. The DC-10, the DC whatever else. Very nice planes, very uniquely shaped planes. The wings used to be in the back of the plane and they used to have a third engine on top of the uh, the vertical stabilizer and all that very unique looking planes mcdonald douglas planes i don't think they fly anymore too many of them but yeah it was a great company but after they merged with boeing it all went downhill slowly slowly you don't see it decline very rapidly it takes time but eventually it becomes bad so that's where boeing is today um 
Dungar Singh Chauhan says, what's the BGV theorem by Alexander Belenkin? I haven't heard of this. Let's Google it. Let's try and Google it. I haven't heard of this. Strange. I typically know everything. <laughs> okay, what's BGV theorem? BGV theorem. What is this? Okay, Bode Guts Vilenkin theorem, physical cosmology that is the average that the universe that any universe has on average been expanding throughout this history and cannot be infinite in the past, but must have a past space time boundary. Mm, I wasn't aware of this. Uh, okay. This is something I haven't been involved in and I haven't really come across. So it's it's physical cosmology. It's about the evolution of the universe. Uh, deduces that any universe has that has on average been expanding throughout its history cannot be infinite in the past, but must have a past space-time boundary. Yeah, it makes sense, obviously. Oh, sorry. Okay, I did not put that on the screen. I apologize for that. Uh, here is the thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the BGV, the board, the good. So Guth is involved. Alan Guth. Okay, I know the guy. Guth. 1981, the last great progress in theoretical physics. Alan Guth, Guth and inflationary cosmology. So Guth is involved, but yeah, I wasn't aware of this. But it makes sense, obviously. Any universe that has, on average, been expanding throughout its history cannot be infinite in the past, but must have a past space-time boundary. Okay, yeah, it, it makes sense. So that's the BGV theorem, and uh, it does make sense. Logically. Okay. PR Vignesh says, why haven't we found other biochemistry of life, like silicon-based rather than carbon-based life here on Earth? Why has evolution favored carbon-based life? We don't know the answers. We have no idea why the things why things are the way they are. You know, <laughs> there, there are so many mysteries when it comes to the origin of life on the earth. Uh, the simplest microorganisms, unicellular organisms, the simplest of them, have DNA. And DNA is an extremely complex molecule. Extremely complex. And how does something like that evolve? So our planet formed about, what, 4.6, 4.5 billion years before today. And life seems to have emerged about 3.77 billion years before today. So it's about 0 0.8 billion years, 0 0.8, 0 0.9 billion years of time before which life evolved. Now, is that enough time for, for a random soup of chemicals to produce something as complicated as DNA and also proteins? And for all of that to assemble into a single-celled unicellular organism? It's kind of a stretch to imagine that that could happen in that much time because people have done these experiments they take various uh, various elements like carbon and sulfur and all that and they put that in a beaker and they then they create the entire the what, what what would have been the environment of ancient earth with you know electrical charges and all that and they heat it heat up the thing and you do that for a few days then you can see that the amino acids emerge out, out of that so amino acids do emerge from this and we have found amino acids even on on uh, meteorites that fell from the sky. So meteorites do seem to have amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein. But when it comes to DNA, it's a staggeringly complex molecule. And it doesn't make sense that it could evolve naturally, spontaneously. So one of the theories is that when the universe was much younger, See, today the average temperature of the universe is very close to zero Kelvin. To zero Kelvin. It's slightly higher than zero Kelvin, and that's the CMBR temperature, the cosmic microwave background radiation temperature, which is the temperature of the average photon from the leftover afterglow of the Big Bang. So it, the temperature is very low right now. But way back in the early, uh, in, the, in the universe's antiquity, when the universe was much younger, much smaller, it was much hotter. And there was a time when the average temperature in space, in the universe, was the same temperature that we have here on Earth. Okay? 
and the universe was much smaller and there could have been water see water seems to be quite abundant in space so there was warm temperature there was all these there were all these various elements that are the outcome of the death of stars like carbon like oxygen like nitrogen like sulfur and so on so, and so forth iron also iron is the iron marks the death of a star and so on so you had all these elements you had all these chemicals you had a warm temperature you had lots of water so it's possible that life would have just evolved spontaneously in space and then as the universe got bigger expanded and it grew colder that life the seeds of that life just froze in space and they hitched the ride on various asteroids and space rocks and all and maybe that is what seeded life on earth that is one of the hypotheses that that goes around it's called panspermia so maybe the life forms that came on earth from there from there they were carbon based life forms because we don't find silicon based life forms on the planet so there are lots of mysteries when it comes to the origin and evolution of life on the planet there are lots of things we cannot cannot explain at all how does something like dna evolve naturally something as complicated as dna evolve yeah so yeah so there are many mysteries there are lots of questions that are unanswered and it's a fascinating topic we don't know why evolution favored carbon based life maybe for some reason it was carbon based here maybe somewhere else it may be something else based we haven't found officially any life anywhere else apart from our planet we are looking but we we have very crude instruments well, telescopes and all that yeah we have to go elsewhere and, and set foot somewhere so you know we can start with the solar system you know europa enceladus these these are moons uh, even titan so i'm talking about moons of saturn and and jupiter so there are good candidates for life these some of these moons so europa has a subsurface ocean of water well known uh, um, enceladus also has subsurface water it, it shoots out these geysers of water into space which tells you that there is heat inside there is thermal activity geothermal activity uh, and there's titan which has this complex uh, soup of hydrocarbons thick soup of hydrocarbons in its atmosphere it has methane lakes and rivers and all very interesting environment there could be some form of life there very cold but there could be some form of life there and so on so there are candidates for candidate worlds for the existence of life on in our solar system we need to possibly explore those send robotic probes and find what find out what's happening and so on i'm sure life could be pretty common in the universe but the universe is so big that we cannot see in the in our uh, the the range of our instruments isn't that great it's not great at all it's very rudimentary very primitive okay um when will we find the mystery between behind dark matter and dark energy we don't know uh we are, we are busy fiddling with string theory string theory this and string theory, theory that the entire us academic system when it comes to physics is has been captured by the string theory mafia and if you ask them tell me one prediction the experimentally verifiable prediction that the string theory has made they will have no answer so we have spent i don't know 40 50 60 years on string theory which is the, the mainstream theory now for trying to unravel what gravity is for a theory of quantum gravity but nothing has come out of it except for very complicated and sometimes pretty math so as long as we keep this we remain fixated on string theory i don't think there's going to be any breakthrough and secondly we need experiments that throw out new evidence through throughout new data so when we go back to the time when the last big revolution happened in physics which is a century ago more than a century ago which is when you had the birth of quantum mechanics starting from 1900 and then you had the birth of relativity first special relativity and then general relativity so what drove these theories was that you had experimental data experiments were being done uh, and that's and they gave us new data they gave scientists new data to and new mysteries to ponder and uh, that's why and, and there was no dogma at the time uh, the kind of dogma that you we have with string theory so there were these conditions so we need to recreate those conditions uh 
So I think it, it's going to take time for us to crack the mystery behind dark matter and dark energy. We'll have to understand what gravitation is. Gravity. Gravity is the big mystery. We don't understand what gravity is. General relativity tells us things about gravity. I mean, it's a stupendously successful theory. The second most successful theory in physics after quantum field theory. But general relativity doesn't work at the quantum level, at the ultra microscopic level. And when it comes to quantum mechanics, uh, there's no gravity in that. Gravity doesn't exist in quantum mechanics. So these two theories, they don't work together. When you try to reconcile the two together, it, it leads to inconsistencies and paradoxes and all that, such as the singularities that you have within black holes. A singularity is division by zero in your mathematical equation, which obviously is unphysical, which means that your mathematical equation is wrong, which tells you that there is a big problem in general relativity when it comes to uh, extremely small regions of space, the quantum domain, an extremely high curvature, an extremely high mass. That's when you have these infinities and so on. And dark energy is even more mysterious. And we don't even know what it is. Dark matter, we know it could be a class of particles. Okay. We know it could be a class of particles. It is some kind of substance. It could be unknown particles, but and particles that interact only gravitationally. So that much we know about dark matter. And we know that it forms halos around galaxies and all. You have theories like modified Newtonian gravity, MOND and all, that seek to explain the rotation curves of galaxies without without the need for dark matter. But dark matter is a mainstream theory and it could be a class of particles. Dark energy, we don't even know what it is. We don't even know whether it is some kind of fluid, whether it is some kind of force. No idea. So dark energy is the bigger mystery, but it is the thing that is impelling the accelerating expansion of the universe. So yeah, big mystery, which should be fascinating, which, which is which is great actually. But there are, and you know what? What we see in the universe, all the stars, all the galaxies, all the planets, all the light that we see in the universe, it's about 4% of the mass of the universe. 96% of the mass of the universe is dark. About roughly... 25% roughly is dark matter, and roughly 70% is dark energy. And dark energy is this mysterious fluid or force or whatever it is that is causing the accelerating expansion of the universe. So we understand only 4 or 5% of the universe, and that too not very well. And 95% of the universe is dark. That's how little we know about the world. And that's, that's great, because there's so much to discover. So if you are a researcher, a theoretical physicist, it's great. I mean, go grab glory, right? Uh, yeah, but right now, it, it looks like it will take time before we kind of figure out what these things are. Okay. Um, where are we? Where are we? Where are we? What else do we take? Swami Jain says, was paper invented in India? I don't know if paper was invented in India. We had papyrus in ancient Egypt, uh, dating back uh, maybe 3,000, 4,000 years, maybe even 5,000 years. I don't remember exactly how old uh, the invention of papyrus when it happened. Paper in India. Look, one thing that is quite curious and mysterious about the Saraswati Sindhu era of our history what they call the Harappan or Indus Valley Civilization. One of the curious things is that there are so few inscriptions with the so-called Harappan script. Very few of them. We get some seals with some two, three characters and, and so on. There's very few inscriptions available. Why is that? One hypothesis that I could put forth is that the people, our ancestors of that time, they used to write on either paper or parchment or cloth. And that obviously disintegrated over the, over the millennia. Because when it comes to this region, this enormous region that is mainly in India, some parts in Pakistan, there's tremendous amounts of rainfall every year. There's a rainy season every year. And, uh, and, and it's quite warm. It's not cold. It's not frozen. So these things, you know, organic material disintegrates and decomposes rapidly. So maybe that's why we have not been able to find more examples of Harappan uh, script. Because may, maybe it was all written on, on some kind of paper or parchment or, or cloth. 
and that's why it's not available today. So that's a hypothesis. Do we have evidence for it? Not yet, not quite. So I don't know. So the answer is, I don't know whether paper was invented in India. Maybe it was, but do we have evidence? We don't. So that is simply where we are. So if you look at uh, ancient inscriptions in Sanskrit and all, they used to be written on birch bark. Birch, birch is a, a tree that's found in the northern regions of India. You go to northern India in the cold regions where it snows, you will find birch trees. So that bark of the birch tree was used for, you know, writing texts and you obviously also use palm leaves and all that so not sure about paper as far as i know we have we don't have evidence that paper was invented in india but maybe but we don't have evidence okay <laughs> so yeah ayush says cern aims for dark matter during eclipse any thoughts i don't know what kind of sensationalist headlines these newspapers and publications come up with. There's some eclipse happening somewhere in some part of the world. CERN has an instrument, a very large instrument called the Large Hadron Collider, which accelerates protons typically to extremely high velocities, very close to the speed of light, but you can't touch the speed of light, obviously. And then these proton beams are smashed together. And you want to see what comes out of the debris of this explosion. Because you could see, you know, fundamental particles emerge from that. You know, fundamental particles do emerge from that for a very brief amount of time. So that is what the experiment is about. And maybe some kind of dark matter clue could come out of it, perhaps. So that's an ongoing experiment. If this instrument is operated when there is a solar eclipse somewhere in the world, how does it matter? How is it connected? So these sensationalistic, sensational, sensationalist headlines that, and, and what, what were they saying? Some ghost particle will emerge apparently during the eclipse. I don't know what kind of unscientific nonsense these people peddle. So if you are someone who doesn't have a grounding in science, let's say you've not studied science after the 10th standard, then obviously you will not understand this. And it's not your fault. You're not supposed to understand this. So, and then you rely on these, I mean, you will, and let's say you're curious about science, what's happening, then you will read these, uh, whatever news comes out. And sometimes they come up with these ridiculous headlines that CERN is 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 trying to communicate with extra, extraterrestrials or CERN is trying to open a portal to a different dimension or a different universe, a wormhole. And the eclipse is a special time when these things happen. Goodness. No, no, no. So please, please don't don't believe these ridiculous claims. They're all nonsense. Okay. Avni Rai says, geopolitical question, why is no one helping Palestine? Where are the world leaders now? Uh, one of the questions that needs to be raised, that need to be raised, is that if the Palestinians are suffering so badly, why aren't the uh, Arabic nations opening the doors to Palestinian refugees. Clearly, they don't they don't want any Palestinian refugees. Now, when it comes to the fact that other nations should help Palestine when this unfortunate situ situation exists, well, the first nations that would should help Palestine should be the neighboring nations. Obviously, Israel is the nation that's fighting Palestine, but the neighboring nations should send aid, should send relief, should perhaps take Palestinian refugees. But that's not happening. <laughs> Why is that? So I guess the other Arabic nations don't like the Palestinians. It's an issue, but they don't want the Palestinians to come and uh, set up camp in their homeland. That, that's what it looks like. Now, where are the world leaders now? Look, it's not the world leaders problem. The Americans like to claim that the other leader of the free world, then why don't you go and solve the problem? But and what they they airdrop some some supplies, some food supplies and all that, some medicines perhaps. Uh, but beyond that, they've done nothing. So that is how it is. See, at the end of the day, in geopolitics, it's all every nation is driven by its self-interest. You will say nice things about peace and brotherhood and dancing around trees and all that. You will signal a great amount of virtue 
but at the end of the day you will be driven by your self interest when somebody else is in trouble unless you are treaty bound to help them you won't help them so that is simply the way the world works <clears throat> Okay. Parth says, <clears throat> excuse me, China always gets benefited by the move of the US over India. So do you think there is any Sino-American friendship in the background because America wants a villain who seems to be second USSR? <laughs> um, well, the Americans did have indeed imposed sanctions on China, the semiconductor sanctions and other things, all that. There is that. Trump started a trade war a tariff war, trade barriers, tariffs and all that, which has been uh, continued. That policy has been continued by the Democrats, by Mr. Biden or whoever it is that's running the government. Clearly not Biden. But yeah, so there is that between the US and China. And there is this military competition. The Chinese seek to retake Taiwan, all that. We, we know the thing, right? But the Americans uh, do, do make some moves that would kind of benefit China over India. When it comes to India versus China, they kind of sometimes benefit China. And we have to understand that the economies of the two nations, the US and China, are conjoined. Conjoined. It is not visible from here, but the two economies are conjoined. If there's a war between the two nations, and let's say China is destroyed, which it most likely will in a war with the US, I mean, China, China stands no chance against the US. When it comes to warfare, China doesn't stand a chance, not a chance, against the US. Now, I'm going to be releasing my index of global power very soon. But let me show you, let me show you a preview, a preview of that index of the global rankings. So let me put that on the screen. And then hopefully it will make sense. So I'm showing you the top 10 nations. Okay, this is going to be released soon. It's going to be the hard power rankings of all nations in the world. And there's a hard power score, as you can see. So the, the hard power rank one is the US. It has a hard power score of 93.32. This is my calculation. I'm going to be releasing this soon. So the US is number one. 93.32 is the hard power score. Number two is Russia. Its score is 54.25. So the US is a superpower. Russia is a near superpower. China comes third at 15.223. Do you see the difference between China and Russia? China isn't a match even for Russia. And China is in no way a match for the US. And that, and if you look at this table, you will see India is four, France is five, and so on. Israel is 10. If you look at this table, then you will understand why the Americans are so worried about Russia and why they have sought to encircle Russia and why they have sought to impose every single possible sanction on Russia and why it has not worked. This table will help you understand why the Americans consider Russia their primary threat, even though they keep on talking about China. They want to divert the attention of the world towards China while working on the real threat, which is Russia. Right? So if if if, it, if there's a war, and if you want to understand how I calculated all that, check out my course in which I have explained how to calculate hard power. So it's not just GDP. GDP is one component of hard power. There are lots of other components. So where was I? China. So China doesn't stand a chance in a war against the US. They will be obliterated if there's a war. Uh, but the U.S. sees India also, so as you can see, once again, let me put that back on the screen. If you look here, number, number four is India. Now, India is just 4.91, which is like insignificant compared to the U.S. But India in the future will rise and the hard power score will rise. By 2050, India's hard power score could be ahead of China if India does the right things. So the U.S. sees India as a long-term adversary. Right now, India doesn't matter for the U.S. in terms of hard power. But in terms of the long-term potential for India, India can be a competitor to the U.S. And they would not like that, that to happen. So they use India and China to counterbalance each other. They do certain things that will benefit China or India. And they do things that will benefit India or China. 
and the ideal situation for the US is that India and China go to war and smash each other out and both problems are gone. Then they can focus only on Russia. That sort of thing. And one of the way to one of the ways to to counterbalance both Russia and China at the same time for the US is to give Japan nuclear weapons. And Henry Kissinger said last year, a few months before he died, that Japan will probably be a nuclear weapons power in the next five years. Yeah, let's see how that goes. It will be good for India, but I'm not sure it will be good for Japan because it won't be Japan's choice if that happens. <clears throat> okay. Giuseppe Pedifraia says, whoops, where is it? Giuseppe Pedifraia says, most of the human beings and their stress will revert back to savage animalistic tendencies. Uh, look, when you're under stress, stress is obviously caused by certain things. And uh, it typically is a sign of an existential threat of some kind. The threat could be immediate or the th threat could be long term. So stress is a reaction to various kinds of circumstances in life. Now, if you're talking about stress such as poverty, malnutrition, let's say you are in a nation where everybody is below the poverty line. There are nations like this, unfortunately, in the world. Okay. You're in a nation where you have to fight for your next meal. You don't eat three meals a day, you eat one meal a day, and you have to fight for that meal. Okay? If you take a nation and impoverish it that much, where people have to fight just to exist, then there will be no point. They, they, they will not worry about culture and sophistication and civilization. That is immaterial. Survival is at stake. And when survival is at stake of you and your family, then you got to go and fight. And that's how you reduce societies to very primitive, to, to exhibiting very primitive behavior. So that's how it happens. It's just a survival mechanism. So you either fight or die. That's how it is. And then if you choose to fight, then you got to go back to fighting in any way possible. Your objective is to get the meal and the other guy is fighting on the same meal. So you got to take him out. So to take him out, you're going to have to behave in certain fashions, which are very primitive, savage, and like you say, animalistic. So only prosperous societies are civilized. The richer you are as a society, the more civilized you are. That is one of the ways of the world. There you have it. <laughs> Abhishek Saman says, does Israel have a nuclear facility in the Negev desert? Is that just for research or something more? Uh, shall we look at the map? Since you have asked a question about the desert in Israel, let's take a look at the map. Here's the map. Where's the map? Here it is. Okay. Let's find the nation of Israel. So it's on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea. Here you have Israel. So now, where is this desert? Okay, let's find the desert. So let us orient ourselves by first finding Beersheba. And south of Beersheba is the desert that you are referring to, the Negev Desert. As you can see, it's a very arid, dry land. There are some patches, splashes of green around Tiberias and all, but southern Israel is all, all dry. So now we found Beersheba. Let's go further south of Beersheba and we have this desert here, the Negev Desert. And let's go to this place called Dimona. Dimona. Dimona is a nice place. Now let's look around Dimona. Yes, we find something here. It's called Negev Nuclear Research Center. As you can see, there's a big road that surrounds it. It's probably a boundary, a barrier, a wall probably. And if you look in here, you find this wonderful little thing. It is a nuclear reactor. So it's, it's a dome. It's a cooling dome of a nuclear reactor. And there could be more reactors here. Certain reactors can be shaped differently. So this is clearly 
Now it's officially labeled as the Negev Nuclear Research Center. Now there was a gentleman called Mordechai Vanunu. His name was Mordechai Vanunu and he worked at this Negev Nuclear Research Center. And he surreptitiously took photographs of what was happening inside. And then he leaked those photographs to the now defunct uh, News of the World newspaper in the UK. And that's how the world came to know that Israel had nuclear weapons and a nuclear weapons program. So there is nuclear research that happens there. Nuclear weapons are produced there. I'm not sure where they are stored. Obviously, they will not let us know. They will not tell us that, that information is classified. But yeah, that's the deal. So there is a nuclear facility in the Negev Desert, like I just showed you. And they do uh, produce fissile material for nuclear weapons there, which would be, I, I would imagine, plutonium. Uranium is, plutonium makes more sense compared to uranium. You need less plutonium compared to uranium to reach critical mass, which means to spark off a nuclear chain reaction. In other words, a nuclear explosion. Uh, so yeah, that is the deal. That's what I can say. It is said to be for research, but they clearly uh, produce fissile material for nuclear weapons or there. He just says, why are there no underwater cities? If we can go into the space, think of colonizing Mars. What is stopping us going underwater for mining and other needs? Well, living underwater, first of all, we humans are, as, as we all know, not aquatic animals. We breathe oxygen. We don't have gills like sharks and other fish do. So we can't take advantage of the oxygen that's dissolved in water in the oceans. So for human beings to live underwater, you would need life support systems. You would need oxygen, you would need clean water, not salty water like seawater. You would need fresh water to uh, clean, potable water, drinkable water. You would need food. So you would have to bring in all these supplies from the surface. And to maintain a habitat that could support, let's say, a, let's say a hundred people, you would need a reasonably large habitat. You would need a lot of uh, air. You would need uh, to recycle the oxygen, the, the air, to scrub the carbon dioxide and purify the air. So you would need a tremendous amount of investment just to create a habitat for 100 people. And that would be recurring investment day after day. That you would have to spend money on that. You would have to build machines that can do all these things. So imagine building a city of, let's say, 10,000 people, which is just a town, actually. 10,000 people, imagine how much work will go into sustaining that habitat. And what do you get out of it? Maybe you mine. Maybe you're doing mining. Well, you can do the same thing with robots. You can, you want to mine for, for oil and gas. You can have these big rigs, oil rigs, which cost a fraction of what it would take. And they do all the work for you. They drill deep under the seabed, and extract oil, gas, whatever they need. And if you want to mine for metals and all, you can use uh, robotic uh, underwater vehicles, submarines and all that, which also happens. The point is you don't need human presence, a human presence under underwater to do all these things. You can do all this robotically with a fraction, a very small fraction of the cost that it would, it would take to maintain a habitat for a large number of people underwater. So. And, and obviously, there's a lot of risk involved in, in maintaining a habitat. If the glass cracks for whatever reason, those 100,000 people are gone. So these are some of the reasons why it's never been done. And yeah, because it doesn't make sense economically. And you have other solutions for mining and extracting whatever resources. <clears throat> Anu Sharma says, why is the current US regime, it seems, so weak? Who's actually ruling? ruling, I suppose, ruling the US. Uh, it appears weak. The US uh, is losing influence in the world. It's not losing its power by any means. Once again, let me show you the global hard power rankings, which will tell you the whole story. Even though the Biden regime appears very weak, look at these rankings and look at the hard power score of the US. 93.32. The next is Russia, 54.25. And then it's China, 15.23. See the immense gap between the US and Russia and the US and China. And India is just 4.91. So the US, it may appear to be weak, 
but that's simply because it is losing some extent to some extent influence there's a difference between power and influence power is the ability to command and control and the us isn't losing that it's you it's losing influence which means fewer people want to listen to the us fewer people are favorably inclined to the us fewer people trust the us fewer people respect the us but the ability to command and control hasn't gone anywhere so that is power so the current regime does seem weak obviously you have biden joe biden who obviously is not ruling the country the guy isn't capable of taking care of himself then his vice president is miss miss kamala harris who isn't the smartest person in the world let's just put it like that you know respectfully so obviously she's also not ruling the country so who's ruling the country somebody is and the policies of the us are this this tremendous problems in the us everything the price this inflation everything is expensive people can't you know can't get married can't can't raise families because everything is so expensive you just working two jobs three jobs just to put food on the food on the table three meals a day you can't afford rent you can't afford uh, you know utilities you can't afford gas which is petrol and so on so things are bad in the us but who's suffering the people are suffering the us isn't losing its power <laughs> that's the paradox okay so things look bad it's it's bad for the people in the us things life is hard these days if you are an american citizen an ordinary average american citizen life is hard yes uh, and it doesn't seem to be on the way to getting easier in time soon so that is true but the us isn't losing its power it's losing some influence it loses it's losing trust and respect in the eyes of the world because of its overtly hypocritical behavior one set of rules for me and you have to abide by a different set of rules i can do whatever i want but you have to abide by certain things that's hypocrisy and that's so transparent these days so that is the deal it's losing respect prestige influence trust but not power who's ruling the us <laughs> uh who's ruling the us not biden not miss harris i suppose it is um the defense established the military industrial complex the the oligarchs of the us you know the, the rich billionaires and all that that entire cabal coalition what uh, some people would like to call the deep state it, probably they are the ones who's, who's ruling the us i'm just guessing speculating i don't have any information but if you think logically that is the answer that kind of makes sense okay atharva says what do i think about the attack in moscow is there a chance of us involvement and how can such a great intelligence agency of russia fail to detect and stop such a massive attack while at war you see when you're at war you are already stretched out in various directions you're focused on certain things you're focused on, on ukraine you're focused on, on other things if you look at the size of russia let's go to the map once again where is map is map is here okay look at the size of russia see how big it is and the and, and do you think it's it's humanly possible for an intelligence agency to be able to monitor everything that's happening everywhere obviously they would like to monitor moscow i agree i agree uh so th the point is first of all first of all i would like to say that it is it's it's not possible to catch all the fish some fish will always slip through unfortunately that is just a statistical probability but you can't catch all the fish in in other in other words you can't uh catch all terrorists and you can't uh uncover all terrorist plots sometimes something will unfortunately slip through so if if there's an attack of this magnitude in the capital of the country obviously it's an intelligence failure yeah so yes the intelligence agencies will have to take the blame and i expect certain heads will roll in the in the, in the sense that some people will be sacked demoted promoted whatever so that is there but on the other hand it's Im almost impossible to catch all the uh, uncover all the terrorist plots now uh, is there a chance of american involvement 
I would say that the chance of American involvement is non-zero. But I don't know if it is a high chance or if the probability is high or low. Uh, that is anyone's guess. Uh, the Russians are saying, first of all, ISIS-K, Khorasan province, based out of Afghanistan and Central Asia, who target India, who want, would like to target India, they claim responsibility for this attack. And some people would say that ISIS is a creation of the US. I mean, I have a book somewhere, Black Flags, check it out if you want to. <laughs> okay, so ISIS came into existence miraculously overnight when the Syrian war was going on and they fought Syria. Who else was fighting Syria? The US. And after Donald Trump came to power and he cut funding for all these things, ISIS disappeared. Now there is ISIS-K in Khorasan province, but they are like a small faction. So if ISIS-K has claimed responsibility, that could be a means of diverting attention from where the real responsibility lies. And the Russians are saying it is Ukraine. And there could be at some point in time a proper retaliation for what happened if they indeed uncovered the fact that it was Ukraine that was behind this. And the perpetrators who have been all captured were Tajiks. If, if it is the modus operandi of, of ISIS fighters that they want to die is in, uh, in the terrorist attack, they typically use suicide bombings. Or if they use guns or whatever, they ensure that they die. I mean, they want martyrdom. So these ISIS, these Tajik terrorists who did all this in Moscow, they did not intend to die. They had escaped. They were apparently traveling towards Ukraine. So maybe the Russians are right. Maybe Ukraine is behind this. And if Ukraine is behind this, it means by, by logical extension, it could perhaps mean that the US could perhaps possibly hypothetically be behind that. Yeah. So obviously, we don't have the intelligence, the, the data the information that the Russians have. But yeah, so we can only speculate and guess at this point in time. But uh, it looks like Ukraine could be involved in this. Looks like. Th that's what the Russians are claiming. And Ukraine, obviously, the Ukraine war is a proxy war between NATO and Russia. Ukraine is the proxy. NATO means the US. So there could be some connection, perhaps. But I cannot make a definitive claim statement without having all the evidence. And I obviously won't have the evidence. <clears throat> the omniscient being says, what were the dark ages? Was it a myth? The dark ages were those times, was, was, was a period of time in Europe where you had uh, no progress whatsoever, when you had uh, superstition, ignorance, uh, no, no science was allowed. If you were a scientist, you would be burnt at the stake. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of persecution of women. Uh, any woman who practiced the pre-Christian uh, arts of uh, pre-Christian traditions, which specifically meant the healing arts, what we would in India call Ayurveda, those women were branded as witches and burned, to, burned alive. And tens of thousands of women were burnt as witches, maybe hundreds of thousands of them. Men were also burnt as witches and all that. So you, you had this terrible time, dark time in Europe where you, your entire life was controlled by one specific institution, which was based out of Rome. And uh, you could not, you know, there was no freedom. There was no progress. There was poverty all around. There was no science. There was no medicine. Uh, there was illiteracy everywhere most people were illiterate there was there was there was slavery in large parts of europe uh, when william the duke of normandy conquered uh, england in the year 1066 and while he was alive and while his son while his son henry the first was alive after the brief reign of rufus uh, william rufus so at that time at least 10% of the population, at least the 10% 10, 10 of the population of England were slaves. And they used to wear these metal collars, copper collars, permanently. And you will find skeletons wearing that because they were buried like that, buried like that. So these were the dark ages. Extremely bad time in Europe. The absence of light, no knowledge, no education, poverty, illiteracy, superstition, 
persecution of women, all of that. So it's a number of centuries. You can look it up what, what centuries those were. I can't remember, but yeah, it was a bad time, very bad time. <clears throat> Geopolitical Dubai says, is a semi-presidential system like France good for India? Um, I would say for India, proper presidential system would be better. Because a large, an enormous subcontinent-sized country like India has to be ruled in a specific way. And if you rule it in a very decentralized manner, you need decentralization, but you also need a consolidation of power in one place. So some power, the right kind of power has to be consolidated in one place, centralized. But there needs to be decentralization of other kinds of power all across the country. What you call the cooperative federalism or whatever. So I think a fully presidential system is actually the right system for Bharat. <clears throat> Vineet Sarkar says, where is the 45 trillion dollars wealth looted from India right now? The GDP of the UK is a fraction of what they looted from India. Listen, when you loot wealth, you don't put it into the GDP. You use it to construct things. When, let, let's say I'm a governor in British India, and I go back to the UK with a tremendous amount of stolen wealth. Okay, not 45 trillion personally, but I let's say I steal a reasonable amount of wealth. I'll go back to the UK and construct myself a great mansion. I'll buy things. Right? I'll buy lands. I'll go to other countries and buy land. Maybe I'll go to North America, which was then under, under Britain, and buy large amounts of land there and build houses there. So all of that wealth was invested in this manner, in this manner. And obviously, it, it led to the rise of certain families, banking families, perhaps. For example, there was this individual called Eliyahu Yale, who stole a great amount of money from India. He founded Yale College, which is now called Yale University. Some of that money that he stole from India would have been invested in buying that la land and all that. Which, and he donated the money for that college. That was money stolen out of India. So over time, all that money was sunk into the nations and reinvested all over the place. And that is what led to the prosperity of Europe. So all the much of the wealth of the world was stolen and concentrated in a small number of people, less than a billion people, the people of Europe, the white people. And then they went ahead and conquered the US. I mean, North America, South America, all that. Uh, the Anglos and <laughs> the British, the English, they conquered North America. They evicted the French eventually. And uh, yeah, an enormous continent they, they stole. And they still occupy it. And some of the money, Indian money, would have gone there as well. So the money won't be liquid. It won't be flowing in the economy. It will all be invested in various parts of the world. That's how it goes. So it's not visible, but it's all gone into creating the wealth that they have. Okay, Mo Sarkar says, how can we identify the fundamental particles produced during collisions in the LHC. So we have a large list of, of known particles and we know their properties. We know what mass they have, what charge they have, what uh, mass and charge typically is, is enough to know a large number of properties. So what you do is the place in the collider where the collision actually happens, you have a number of uh, an array of instruments around that. And those instruments, they capture the characteristics. So when, when a, let's say two cars are colliding, okay, two cars. Two cars are colliding with no, no occupants. Okay, it's a robotic crash. We want to see what happens. So let's say two cars, each has a speed of 150 kilometers per hour. They, they'll go head on, no occupants. And then you can take, uh, what you can do is you can take a high frame rate film of that. Let's say 2000 frames per second. So you can see the collision in slow motion and you can see every component that comes out of it. Similarly, that's what, what is done for the LHC. You take snapshots through various means. You have a magnetic instrument that see, and, and when a charged particle goes through a magnetic um, through magnetic lines of force, it curves in a certain direction. And based on the curvature and the speed and the mass that you can detect, you can detect what kind of particle it is. So, and then you have certain, sometimes you find an unknown particle that doesn't belong in your particle, in your list of particles. 
because you can deduce the mass through these various means. And this particle has a certain mass that we don't know any particle has that mass. And that's how they detected the Higgs boson. So there are a variety of instruments that are in place around the collision chamber. And they examine the debris of the collisions in a variety of different ways. And that's how we identify what particles come out, whether it is pions, whether it is electrons, whether it is neutrinos, uh, or various more exotic particles, short-lived particles, psi particles, and all. Certain particles are just short-lived particles, and they, they, they once again disintegrate into something else. Or sometimes you have antimatter that's produced. There was the speculation that 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 micro black holes will be produced in the LHC. I remember in 2008, 2009, at that time, there was, a, there was this book, big hoopla that the LHC will produce micro black holes and these they will swallow up the, the earth. And that even if it produces micro black holes, it would still not have been a threat to the, uh, to the earth. And I had at that time written, uh, written an article about that. So yeah, so we can detect these, I de detect and identify these particles through all of these different instruments. Some instruments can detect the charge of the particle, some can detect the mass of the particles, and some can detect the track, what track the particle took, whether it was a straight line, whether it was, it was a curved track and so on. So based on all of this data that we get, we can specifically identify which particle, each of these particles, what, what it is. Okay. <clears throat> Ramai Raj Singh says, I recently had a chat with the British National. He told me that Sunak is stupid and that the UK is better off under the, under the Labour Party. Most Westerners still, still something. Look, everybody has an opinion. Rishi Sunak is not an elected Prime Minister. He's a selected Prime Minister. It's true, right? He, ca he came to power after the... Uh, so you had Boris Johnson, who mysteriously resigned for some reason. Some, some scandalous, scandalous pictures came out of him doing something scandalous, apparently. So he had to resign. Then there was a lady who was there for like three and a half hours. Liz Truss, was it? Ten days? Whatever whatever it was. The, the, sh the shortest serving prime minister of the UK. Then she goes, and then Rishi Sunak comes to power. So clearly these are selected prime ministers. Rishi Sunak has not fought and won an election like Boris Johnson did. But Overall, I suppose he's a reasonably intelligent person and whatever policies he's following, those policies are essentially dictated by the US. The overlord in Western Europe and in the EU and in NATO is the US. US. And UK is, is very much a vassal state of the US. It's undeniable. So visible now. So whatever Rishi Sunak is doing is essentially doing whatever the US wants him to do because you cannot afford to displease the master. And if some people find him stupid, I don't think, I don't find him stupid. He's reasonably intelligent. Uh, but whether it's the Labour Party or whatever other party, the policies are all going to be dictated by the US. The way it is in Japan, doesn't matter who's the prime minister, certain things never change. So. That's just what it is. That is the harsh reality of life in the UK. <clears throat> okay, what else? What else? Um, Arjun Uthekar says, what do you think about the recently released movie Swatantra, Swatantriya Veer Savarkar by Randip Hudda? I haven't seen it yet, but I do want to see it. If I can find some time, I would like to spend, how long is the movie? Two, three, three hours? I don't know. I would like to see it. So I don't know yet. I've seen the trailer. The, tra the trailer was very interesting. And it's going to kind of change people's perceptions of, of the history of India. So I would like to see it. I hear it is good, but I haven't seen it yet. So maybe I'll see it hopefully this week. And in the next episode, I can perhaps give you my feedback about it. Okay. Rohit Das says, is the US governed by a certain group of institution, for example, the military, etc. The US is governed by an invisible entity, which is not part of, a, of any one institution. So 
I say this because Biden is not ruling the country and Kamala Harris is not ruling the country, but clearly somebody is. So it would most likely be, the likelihood is high that it would be the foreign, the, 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 the State Department establishment, the foreign, the foreign establishment, the military industrial complex and the various oligarchs who uh, you find in the US, the, the top billionaires and all that. It would be a coalition of these people. Maybe somebody else rules them. We don't know. <laughs> One can only speculate. So that's what I can say. Gaming Lover says, why did apes stop evolving as humans? Listen, have you seen the cat family? The cat family. You have on the large scale, you have tigers. The largest cat in the world is a tiger. Then the second largest cat is the lion. They are very different, yes. Then you have leopards, you have cheetahs, you have uh, pumas, you have lynxes. Then you have wild cats in the forest. Then you have the standard issue domestic cat that we are familiar with that lives in people's houses and outside the houses. Yeah. Then you have even smaller cats. Now the question you can ask is why did the house cat stop evolving like the tiger? Evolution takes, <laughs> so that's the kind of answer. The question, evolution takes you on different branches. We had a common ancestor with chimpanzees and gorillas about, I don't know, how many million years ago? I think five, four or five million years ago. So about around maybe 10. Okay, I don't remember the exact timeline. You can look it up if you are interested. But at a certain point in time, not that long ago, our ancestors were the same as the ancestors of the chimpanzees and the gorillas and the other apes. And then because of geographical distribution, each of the branches evolved separately. Let me go back to the map. Where's the map? Here's the map. One second. So the best data, the best evidence that we have points to the fact that humanity evolved in Africa. If new evidence comes up, I will revise my opinion. But based on what we have today, the best evidence that we have says that humanity evolved in Africa. Now, there is something called the Rift Valley in, in Eastern Africa. And what probably happened is that different species of our different groups of our ancestors, common ancestor with all these apes, they were isolated on two different regions in Africa. And over a couple of million years ago, because there was no interaction between these two groups so that they were permanently divided, they evolved differently. And in, in the past, uh, the number of humans or our ancestors was quite low. And they would travel and they would get isolated from each other, maybe sometimes permanently. And that's how they evolved differently over a few lakh years, few million years. And they all appeared as different species eventually. So some became gorillas, some became chimpanzees, some became bonobos, some gibbons, some orangutans, and so on and so forth. And some humans. Here we are. And we are the most intelligent of the apes, the most evolved, evolved in intellectually of the apes. Physically, we are the weakest of the apes. A chimpanzee is way shorter than a human being, but way stronger than a human being. And don't even talk about gorillas, how strong they are. So physically, we are the weakest of the apes, but this is what has set us apart. And that's why we have evolved so far. So nobody has stopped evolving. Everybody is evolving all the time, but evolution takes a very long time to become apparent. So if you look at humans that would have existed 100,000 years before today, they would have probably looked very much like us. There could be some superficial minor changes, minor cosmetic differences, but overall they would have been very much like us. So the oldest evidence of Homo, homo sapiens is 400,000 years ago in North Africa, Jibel Irhud. So those were anatomically modern Homo sapiens for almost half a million years ago. So that's how slow evolution is. So, so nobody has stopped evolving. We have all, all evolved differently. Just like the cats. There are so many different species of cats. There are so many different species of butterflies. There are so many different species of, uh, well, not the dogs. There are breeds of dogs. but And, and the dog is a subspecies of the wolf, of course. But yeah, if you look at the wolf and the bear, 
you can see some similarities in the face. The face is similar, right? The wolf and the bear. So there is some, they will have a common ancestor for sure, including, and they would have a common ancestor with the whales as well. So evolution is very interesting, but nobody has stopped evolving. Okay. Okay, what happened here? Okay, Mayank Kumar Gautam says, who is the better PM, Atalji or Modi ji? <laughs> You're asking a difficult question. I will say Modi ji. Okay, what else? Okay, we have crossed two hours. I should end this now. Uh, Rudra Notial, hello, sir. Hello, hello. Let's take maybe one more question. Let's take one more question. Okay, when will the next elephant evolution take place? Everything is evolving. Every species is evolving. But the, like I just said, evolution becomes apparent only over very long periods of time. So let's say you are reborn 100,000 years from now. You will see a diff, probably see a slightly different kind of elephant at that time. Okay. Um, Okay. <clears throat> Yash says, how to study history, geopolitics, and present scenarios together? Look, studying anything properly takes time. I understand geopolitics because I've studied history, history world history, for since, since I was a child. Probably since I was seven or eight years old. I was interested in history. And I used to study history from not your school textbooks, which are horrifically boring, but other books. And... Uh, done that for a long time that's how i understand uh, that's how i have an understanding of geopolitics because geopolitics is all about the same patterns that you see across history so how do you study it together you read 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 in your spare time read in your, in your free time find whatever book you can find and read and read indiscriminately read any book that you find and then hopefully if you do that over five years ten years you will gain a reasonably good understanding of the subject or you could take my course on, on geopolitics, which will give you a very quick start on geopolitics. It will explain the fundamental principles of geopolitics in one single four-hour session. So if you're interested, the link is in the description below, ac.university. Okay, let's take one final question. Ishan says, how do you see the future of Western response to Indic technologies and knowledge that were before ignored as India rises? Um, in, I'm not sure what Indic technologies are. Indic knowledge, Indian knowledge, I understand. We we have, see, we had ancient science and all, which was all taken to the West by the Arabs, by the Persians, by the Arabs mainly. And today's science and technology is built on those foundations. Uh, we had our own philosophy, our own historical records, which are all burned down and all. But technology, look, during the Saraswati Sindhu phase, we had extremely advanced technology, shipbuilding, hydro engineering and all that. Uh, we were the inventors of uh, <clears throat> of Seric steel, which is now called Damascus steel. It used to come out of India, crucible steel, two and a half thousand years ago, at least. Southern India, Tamil Nadu, Sri Lanka, etc. Uh, and we have in the past had lots of technologies that emerged out of India. Today, what Indic technologies are, I don't know. Today, we seek to import Western technologies. Uh, and we seek to, yeah, that's what it is. So that's the situation. There are no te secret technologies that we have in India today that are superior to today's Western technologies. So that is just the, the truth, the factual truth of the matter. Cash Dynamo says, what degree do you need to become a theoretical physicist? See, a theoretical physicist is somebody who does active research in the unsolved problems of the universe. And for that, you need funding. You cannot be jobless and be doing active research because who's going to pay for your meals? You need an income, right? So a theoretical physicist, first of all, needs to understand theoretical physics and the mathematics behind it and needs to have a job in a research institution or a university. For that, you need a degree of a PhD. <laughs> you can have a master's degree and do it too, but uh, for a job in a research institution of a certain caliber, they would require a PhD in 
in a branch of physics. Typically, something like theoretical physics. Also, it could be an allied branch, a subsidiary branch, but the, that, that is fine. So typically, to be a theoretical physicist, you would need at least a master's degree, ideally a PhD, and you would need employment in, a, in an organization that allows you to do research uh, maybe a few hours a week. That's how you become a theoretical physicist. All right, all right, all right, all right. Uh, shall I take one last question? Shall I take one last question? Um, Siddharth Singh Rajpur Hoyt says, if Mahabharata was real, how would you place it in the timeline with respect to the Indus Valley civilization? Uh, the Saraswati Hindu phase of India's history, probably Mahabharata could have been contemporaneous with that. Maybe with the early part of, the, of that thing. So if the Mahabharata happened, let's say hypothetically 5,000 years ago, then that was in the middle of the Saraswati Hindu phase or what you call the Indus Valley phase of India's history. So if so, the Mahabharata probably was contemporaneous with the uh, Saraswati Hindu phase of Indian history. Maybe the early phase or maybe the slightly more mature phase. So yeah, that's how it probably would be. But that depends on when the Mahabharata happened. It probably happened around five 5,000 or so years before today, most likely. But we still don't know for sure. So that's how I would place it. All right, with that question, with that answer, we are at the end of today's session. Thank you so very much once again for all the questions. I apologize once again to all those of you whose questions I could not take. I'll do more of these as always and we'll take more questions. And hopefully everybody gets to get an answer for me. All right. So until then, thank you very much once again for your viewership, for watching, for your support, for your for everything. And I will see you very soon in the next episode, probably this weekend. Until then, take care. Have a good night, good day, wherever you are, and keep raising your standards. Do something that you're proud of. Thank you.